the easiest place is you know X squared radio all the links are there uh, you can you can always Google uh, the, for the information the arc of millions of years dot com is where the books are for sale my latest book is called remembering the future the physics of the soul and time travel and that's at remembering the future book dot com I absolutely uh, would would love to and hope that we can uh, spend maybe the course of an entire program talking really just drilling into the books that you have uh, that you have authored and and some of the subject matter that you worked with what led you to that research and and to your conclusions and etc uh, but uh, of course we don't have the time today and, and I be my uh, privilege and honor if that could happen at some time in the future but dr. Agnew I, I want to express my most sincere thanks for you joining us today I know that your research has you absolutely buzzing and running and and uh, I, I, I feel very humbled that you, you uh, created this uh, piece of time to join me on this program. And I think that the listening audience uh, thanks you sincerely as well. Sir, your closing comments or thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm humbled too. Uh, the Crimson Pill is uh, going to be a great program on BBS Radio Network. I want to welcome you wholeheartedly to the community. You're doing a great job. I know you're going to be successful. You're on the right track. You've got a good mind, a good voice. Uh, and I can feel the passion. So you've really got a great program here. Thank you so much. Dr. Agnew, your kind words and those sentiments uh, uh, touch me uh, very deeply. And I, I have to tell you, I, I have such a, a respect, such a regard uh, for your approach, your work. You, sir, speak with a voice in, in a field of, uh, of eccentrics. You speak with a voice that is not just academically well-reasoned, uh, but also uh, from a point of spiritual consciousness that uh, is another subject I wanted to get to today, but we can't for now. But for now, you have my most sincere thanks. Thank you again so much for being with me. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, folks, uh, as we close out the program today, please know Dr. Agnew's own radio program, X Squared Radio, comes on in uh, just another, I believe, another hour from now. Don't touch your dials. Keep your uh, browser tuned to station number two right now. You've got a wonderful program beginning in just a few moments. Uh, some folks that I have not had a chance to visit with uh, directly, but I hope to establish that contact soon. And then Dr. Agnew's program begins this evening. Uh, I was absolutely riveted and glued to my BBS.com radio station listening to Dr. Agnew's program last week. I fully intend to, to be and do the same this afternoon as well. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Antonin Fiore. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your willingness to, to learn a bit, uh, to open your mind, to, to uh, sit with us as we uh, waxed poetic about our uh, theories and, and perspective on what we're finding and has happening. Uh, we, we certainly hope the best for you between now and then. And uh, uh, folks, just, just keep in mind that you've got all these resources available to you. Uh, reach out there with your fingertips. Take advantage of the Internet. It is absolutely amazing what we have available if we uh, are willing to commit to the work in ways that Dr. Agnew has done with his research and his career. So, folks, I'm sorry we didn't have an opportunity to take your calls. I'm hoping that we will on next week's program. Uh, it's my understanding that we have a commitment from Dr. Joseph Farrell. Thank you again. Take care. Safe travels. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Hello, folks. It's host Antonin Fiore here with a, just a few closing thoughts uh, on today's program. Uh, we're so thankful to have Dr. Brooks Agnew with us. We th I thought it was a fantastic conversation that we just simply ran short of time. Near the end of the show, you heard us talking a bit about the relationship between the Earth, uh, our Sun, and our Earth's atmosphere and electromagnetosphere. And what's very important to understand about how these rogue, free-floating planets are able to sustain life despite the fact that they're not orbiting a sun, the very significant uh, uh, things to understand are the role of the atmosphere and also the electromagnetosphere. Now, beginning with our electromagnetosphere, it's generated from within the Earth's core, it's large enough to completely surround our atmosphere, and our electromagnetosphere is what prevents our sun from eroding away our atmosphere uh, and becoming something like what we see on the planet Mars with, with uh, a, a very diminished atmosphere and then the uh, effects of the solar radiation that follow that when the atmosphere is removed. Why is the atmosphere important? Well, because it works like layers of filters, not just like sunglasses helping block UV radiation and, and, and other, but it also acts as a filter from the cosmic rays, from the, the radiation itself. 
Now our atmosphere, understand that there are five primary layers, and each layer is a unique blend of its own gases pressurized at, at, uh, at different rates of pressure between the five layers of the atmosphere. Here's, here's what is very essential to understand about this dynamic. Most people would believe that if you travel from Earth's surface, increasing altitude directly up into the air, that the temperature reading would just continue to get colder and colder and colder all the way up to outer space, which, as we know, is very cold itself, near absolute zero Kelvin. However, what most people don't understand is that that's not accurate. In our closest layer to the Earth's surface, the troposphere, as you continue to go up, it does get colder, just like when you go up a mountain. But once you hit the next layer of the Earth's atmosphere, suddenly the temperature begins to rise again quite suddenly, quite quickly, until you reach the next layer of the atmosphere above, in which the temperature drops. But the next layer above that, once again, the temperature increases quite dramatically and rapidly. So in other words, folks, Heating on planet Earth is not strictly a result of the role of the sun and, and its radiation in, uh, that it is emitting, the solar wind also. No. Rather, within each blend of atmospheric gases at its rate of pressurization, there is a different reaction to solar radiation. In some cases, that reaction results in significant heating. And yet, at the very next layer below, different blend of gases, different pressurization, a different result. That is what is essential to understand in realizing that our sun does not heat us in the way that you've been taught in school. It's not like a campfire. If the earth were closer, we wouldn't be hotter. If we were farther away, we wouldn't be colder, unless our atmosphere remained exactly the same. If, we, if our blends of gases in each layer of atmosphere were to change and or the pressurization were to change, our Earth could be four times closer to the sun, and yet our climate could remain much as it is today. Once again, if, if we had a different blend of gases at, at pressurization in our layers of our atmosphere, and then also if the, our electro electromagnetosphere were proportionately stronger as well in the case of moving us closer to the sun. Our electromagnetosphere could be a little weaker, and also the atmosphere would need to be weaker if we were to be moved farther away from the sun to have the same effect. So folks, uh, it's, it's so important to understand these concepts. The reason why is because these free-floating rogue planets, they are capable of sustaining a consistent enough climatary type range due to their atmospheres and electromagnetospheres also followed by internal generation of heat within the planetary body. And so it's not just that life could evolve and maybe sustain itself underground, deep underground, in those types of free-floating rogue planets. No. You could experience life very much as it is here on the face of the Earth on one of these free-floating planets, as long as the atmosphere and its electromagnetosphere were proportion proportionately effective. Some people might think of the Earth, and we think of our climate changes we experience here on the Earth through the course of a year, the different seasons, and how much colder it gets in the winter, simply because due to our, the tilt of the Earth's axis, north, the northern hemisphere receives less solar radiation when it's tipped, tipped or tilted away uh, from the sun, as it is at the period of the summer solstice, when the northern hemisphere would be tipped, so to speak, uh, closer to the sun, so more radiation. That, that model is okay to understand, however, you cannot apply it to the other planets. Why? Well, Earth generates an internal temperature uh, relatively small, relatively weak, uh, it, particularly in comparison to planetary bodies across solar systems. Also, our atmosphere. We think about greenhouse heating. Well, our atmosphere is designed as such in concert with, in balance with, our electromagnetosphere, and then also our internal heat generation. Just like the human body itself adapts on the fly to changing conditions, if you are engaged in heavy physical activity, your body will attempt to compensate by reducing its internal temperature through the course of things like sweating and uh, faster respiration or breathing. Likewise, if we find ourselves in a cold climate, very cold conditions, 
our body also will attempt to respond. The pores in our skin will close so that we're not respiring as much, uh, perspiring as much. Our body adapts to try to uh, internalize or maintain what heat is being produced internally. Well, folks, planets work in much the same way. Now, that's going to be a much longer conversation, but do keep in mind that if you think about Earth and our climate changes, our seasons from one season to the next, you're talking about one apple in a sea of oranges, grapefruits, pears, etc. Every single planet has a different rate of internal heat production, has a different set of atmosphere and complexity of atmospheres, such as, for example, the layers of atmosphere, also the constituent gases and pressurization within each layer of atmosphere, and then finally, varying strengths in each planet's electromagnetospheres. Keep in mind, the Earth and what we think of as the Earth's climate, we could be physically moved half the distance closer to the sun and still maintain this climate that we have now if our atmosphere and our electromagnetosphere were to be, so to speak, retuned proportionately. The Earth could also be twice as far away from the sun as it is right now, once again, with tweaks to the atmosphere and tweaks to the electromagnetosphere, and then once again, depending upon our internal heat production. So ladies and gentlemen, when we think of evolution, the human as we know it today has been finely and specifically adapted it has, it has mutated and through the course of time and change, ad it has become adapted, just like all other species of life on Earth, to our exact blend of gases, pressurization, gravity, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, the evolutionary processes having taken root or, or, or had their origin on a different planetary body would have and could have and in fact have adapted over the course of time to each of those elements of that particular planetary body's mechanics. What is essential to know for now, and hopefully on next week's show, we're going to continue our discussion about NASA's disclosures regarding the not just the rogue and free-floating planets, but also their disclosures about our new understanding of astrobiology, which helps us realize that, indeed, extraterrestrial life can sustain quite fruitfully on one of these planetary bodies, despite the fact that it floats freely through interstellar and also uh, the space of solar systems, but without it uh, uh, maintaining a relatively consistent orbit around a sun. Well, once again, thank you so very much for listening to The Crimson Pill. It's always our pleasure to have you join us. I believe next week we're going to be joined by Dr. Joseph Farrell, who has an incredibly fascinating body of work uh, spanning over the last uh, uh, little over a decade uh, on a range of subjects that is it's just too difficult to get into now, but do a Google search or a Yahoo search for Dr. Joseph Farrell. That's F-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L, and you can get uh, a kind of a primer on some of the uh, body of Dr. Farrell's work. Folks, thanks for joining the Crimson Pill. We sure hope to see you next Sunday and each Sunday thereafter at 1.55 p.m., 3.55 Central, 4.55 Eastern, uh, for your weekly dose of the Crimson Pill. Thank you so much. Take care. Have safe travels. Bye-bye.